Hi, if you like the video, please remember to subscribe. Hi, I'm Rob from RobNoFoto.com and welcome to this very special edition of uh, one of the Subject Composition and Lights gear guides, which is the SEL guide to this fantastic little camera. This is the uh, Olympus Mew 2 or Stylus Epic, it's also known, and, uh, known as, and it really is a very, very special 35mm film camera. Bit of a cult classic, this one. Um, it was uh, came out in about 1997. And I actually went on to be European Compact Camera of the Year from 97 to 98. And you've probably seen lots of cameras very, very similar to this in, in, the, in the, the Olympus stable, in the fact that it has the, you know, the classic clamshell design that you um, open up to turn it on. Very, very small indeed. But the real beauty of this little, uh, little, this little compact camera is the lens. It has a 35mm f2.8 lens that is very good, very, very sharp. Um, and lots of, um, in the film days, lots of uh, pro photographers would carry something like the Olympus Mu2 or the, the Starless, Starless Epic Round as they're almost like their second camera for when they were shooting sort of candies, not for professional work, but, but for sort of personal work. Because what really makes this camera special for me is that it really enables you to have a 35mm film camera in your pocket all the time. Um, because as you can see, it's absolutely small. And the best thing is the amazing image quality you get out to it. And, you know, and I have to admit, the fact that you can pick these things up pretty cheap, especially if you know um, what you're looking for. Um, now, um, sort of specs wise, yeah, it obviously takes 35 millimeter film. Um, it's got auto wind, auto rewind. Um, it one of its Achilles heels is the fact that it does run off the good old CR123 battery. Um, these kind of uh, babies, which they're not that expensive actually. I mean, I picked this this particular one or a pair of these up from Tesco today, and it was seven seven pounds for two. Which I know you think well, that's quite expensive, but you're meant to be able to get about twenty rolls out of each battery. Now, obviously, you'd have to make sure that you had a spare battery with you all the time when you're using a camera like the Muti. Um, it has auto exposure, um, it has uh, auto focus, um, it has a spot metering mode, auto flash, um, and it's weatherproof as well. So if you're out in the rain, you know, it isn't going to go pop. Um, and it has this wonderful clamshell design. So, you know, let's compare it in size really to you know, one of my other favorite cameras, which is this is the um, Olympus Trip 35. And, you, you know, as you can see, the Stylus Epic uh, or the Mew 2 is considerably, considerably smaller than the Olympus Trip 35. Um, and so you should be able to see in the close up there as well. Um, and remember, this is uh, basically, if we look at the thickness of it, it's really only just a little bit thicker than a 35mm roll of film. And in fact, if we compare the, uh, start, the Mew 2, the Stylus Epic, to a full you know, this is a 35 millimeter film SLR. This is a uh, Minolta Dynax. Remember, these things both have the same size film, in, and they take both take the same size image. You know, look at that. Look at the difference in size between those two. There's the there's the Minolta, and there's the Mu2. In fact, the, <laughs> the Mu2 is about the same size as the lens on the Minolta. So again, hopefully, that's giving you a really really good idea of um, how small, how compact packed, how perfectly formed this camera is. And the idea is in this video, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, where you could buy um, a Mew2, where you could pick up a bit of a bargain, what to look out for. And then really there's going to be a little bit of a user guide as well, where I'm going to go through and just show you the different features um, of the camera. Now, but it, it's not a perfect camera by any means, because... Its strengths in the fact that it is fully automatic also means that that's its weakness as well. So you can't always guarantee what you're going to get out of it. But, you know, in nine times out of ten, in most situations, this camera will take a really nice, sharp, great looking photo. Um, and as I say, it's small enough to fit in your pocket. 
Okay, so you know where could you pick up a Mewtwo or Stylus Epic? Well, the first thing I'd probably say is check out your relative. You'd be amazed at how many people that you know you probably know right now might have one of these uh, cameras hidden away. As I said before, they sold over three million versions of this little camera. Um, and uh, it was incredibly popular in uh, the late 90s. Um, car boot sales are a great place in the UK. Uh, thrift stores or charity shops. Um, obviously, you can go on eBay or Gumtree, but sometimes you can pay over the odds. So I would say I wouldn't probably pay more a car boot, more than £10 for, for something like this. Um, but if I was going on eBay and you know it was a trusted seller, maybe I'd sort of pay between twenty and thirty pounds. But you know they do go for an awful lot more because people really do look out for these. Now, the, th the thing that's tricky about the uh, Stylus Epic or the Mew Two is it's part of the larger Stylus or Mew family, and there are a group of cameras that look incredibly similar. Um, there's the earlier version which has got a thirty-five millimeter lens, but I think it's an f three point five lens on it there's also lots and lots of different zoom versions as well and to be honest though if you're sort of shopping around and you're looking for for a camera like a Mew2 if you do see one of these other versions going cheap you know pick them up anyway because they all take great great photos the advantage of the Mew2 it probably has the best lens of all of them and the fact that it's f2.8 means that it's got a quite a wide maximum aperture which means that you know it's going to do well in uh, certain situations where the light isn't so good, and it is the smallest by far of all those particular models. You know, so what should you really look out for when you, you know if you do see a Mewtwo and you pick it up? Um, well, I mean, the first thing to do is, is, is just open it up, open the clamshell design because that that turns the camera on, and just see you know does it work? Does it move? If it moves, then happy days, you know there's a battery in it. Um, but then your next kind of check is to go to the battery compartment, um, pop it open, he says, you know, and check the battery. Take that battery out, obviously ask the seller if it's okay to do that, and just make sure there's no leakage. You don't want any leakage in that battery compartment. You don't want any, any corrosion. Now, if there is a little bit of leakage, you know, a little bit of that green coppery looking stuff, um, and you know they're going to give it for for a few quid. You know, buy it anyway because you can clean this stuff up. But if it's really really corroded and you can't get the battery out, you know, move on. It's just not worth the hassle. If you're lucky enough to get one where the battery still works, again, you can just do some simple tests. When you turn on, does the lens come out? Um, look through the viewfinder. Can you see through the viewfinder? Does it does it look clear? It's not full of crap. Look at the lens on the front. You know, is it clear? I mean, you'd expect it to be a little bit dusty and a little bit dirty. Are there any cracks on the bottom? Is the little window, uh, if we open it up here, there's a little window here that you can probably see if you see on the close-up. Sometimes that goes missing. Again, it's not a deal breaker if that's missing because you can put a little bit of tape over it. Um, but does it look nice and clean in side no crap and everything like that um, if we close up close it up again of course again if we've got a battery that works if we do the half press and the shutter and then we press the <laughs> press the camera does it turn on and does the flash fire if there isn't a battery in it and you just don't happen to have a, a 123 battery with you which you probably won't because you'll come across one of these then you know take the gamble if it looks clean it will probably work and if you get home and you check it and it doesn't work I mean I mean, what the hell, you've only lost um, lost a couple of quid. Um, the other thing I would say as well about the, uh, the the Stylus Epic is a really big advantage. It doesn't really need its own case because it's all, you know, it, it's all, uh, it's got the clamshell design. It can fit in your pocket um, and uh, it's fully automatic. So if you do see one or one of it, one of its similar brethren going cheap, by all means, you know, just pick it up straight away, grab a battery for it, stick some film in and um, you'll be good to go. So what I'm going to talk about next is a little bit more about using the Stylus Epic and some of its features and functions. Okay, so let's look at how you can um, use the uh, Mew2 or the Stylus Epic because one of the greatest things I think about it is if you're new to film photography and perhaps you're a little bit worried about um, things like loading film or getting exposure right and you're worried about you're going to be wasting things the Mew2 or the Stylus Epic really does really does look after you now actually first things first let's have a look at that battery compartment again so 
to get into the battery we just kind of push this little bit there and then we've got our um, our Duracell 123 battery which is just in there so let's close it up so next up let's load some film and really there's a saying isn't they called the film sweats lots of people worry about loading film but it couldn't really be easy with something like the um with the Mew2 or the Stylus Epic let's put some nice colour Kodak film in shall we so all we've got to do we've um, got a 35mm film um, and we just pop that in like there like so and you just kind of you just kind of rest it across the top you don't need to push push it in very far um, there's no fiddling around with spools and trying to get it to connect it's literally it's just that close it up and then with a bit of luck it should I don't know whether it <laughs> I don't know whether it took it or not it has we've gone on to exposure one now if for any reason it doesn't take properly um, normally because you push it in too far it will say E and then you can just open it up and uh, just just take it out a little bit rewind it into the cassette and just, just lie it across like we did and that is all ready to go um, so once we've once once we've got it on now, the first thing I would always suggest you do with the with the Mew Two Stylus Epic when you turn it on is check the flash status. Now in this particular one, I don't know whether you can actually you'll actually be able to see this on the video. You might be able to see it, but there's the little flash icon there. Now because I was playing around with it earlier, it was actually on red eye reduction flash. But normally, when you turn it on, you'll you won't see anything in the little LCD screen apart from the number. Well, whatever whatever frame number we're on number one and what that means is the camera is in fully automatic mode and fully automatic flash mode as well so if it's too dark the flash will fire um, and so imagine you're out doing maybe some street photography or something and you go into the shade and you're trying to do do some nice candid street photography what will happen is the flash will fire now you might not always want that because you know it could draw attention to yourself and you might not be looking for flash photography so the first thing I always say is when you turn it on press the flash button and you want to cycle through that's red eye reduction to that one there now again it might be very very difficult to see that on the video but basically it's a, it's a circle with the flash sign through which means that the flash is off so it doesn't matter how dark it gets that flash will not fire and one of the kind of quirks of the uh, the Mewtwo is if we if we now turn it off and then turn it back on again what you should see is is it's gone back into automatic mode so the flash has turned itself back onto automatic mode and that's really important that you know that that you kind of get it into your um, routine of turning this camera on that you turn that flash off if or unless, i mean unless you're in a situation where having the flash on doesn't matter you're you know at a party or you know we're taking pictures of a friend and family where people are expecting you to but if you don't want people to see the flash go off make sure you turn that little beauty off now to actually use the camera it's it's simplicity itself now with any camera where you're looking through through a little viewfinder and not the lens itself the big danger is that you kind of hold it and you'll get your fingers and thumbs or the strap over the lens while you're looking through. So I'm looking through this lens and, hey, it looks like I'm going to get a really good shot of my camera. But what I can't see is the fact that my fingers are in the way. So, you know, keep everything well out of the way of the camera. You know, and you can do your, you can do your, por you do your portrait or your landscape format, um, sort of like that. And all you do is you kind of look through the viewfinder. And then just like on your digital camera, you press the shutter button halfway. And then over in the right hand side of the screen you'll see a little green light come on, hopefully. And that means that the camera's good to go. Um, it's it, it's good for exposure and it's good for focus. Um, if that light's flashing, it means that it's not good to go, which normally means that your focus too close or it couldn't capture focus. Now, remember with this camera, the way that it gets autofocus isn't by doing anything through the lens, you know, electronically with contrast detector or anything like that. You know, these cameras are much more basic. It actually, I think it uses some sort of infrared that fires out of the front and takes that. So even so, even though I've pressed that button halfway down, and even though the lens has stayed retracted, hasn't popped out yet, it knows how far away my subject is. And again, because I've pressed my, the button halfway down, it's locked the focus. It doesn't lock the exposure at this point, but it locks the focus. And then if I want to take the shot, all I do is press it all the way down. In fact, tell you what, let's turn the flash 
on to automatic so you can see it so I'm looking through so that's a nice picture of my 600d t3i okay and it's telling me the little red light to come on this time so it tell, it's telling me the flash is ready and the flash is going to fire so let's press the button what's going to look at it? there we go now one of the things you probably saw there and in fact if I do this on the close-up camera as well you'll see if I so it's ready to fire now right and if I go I'm going to say now when I press the shutter so now there's a slight lag this is another quirk of the camera because of the way it works the fact that it when you press the button halfway down it then measures the distance of the subject and it gets ready to fire it knows what it's got to do with the lens when you actually press the button all the way down there's a fraction of a second where it's putting the lens out taking the picture and so you know you've got to watch you know watch out for that but again it's a one of the things about the camera that you kind of learn to live with and you know learn to take advantage of um, uh, it's auto wind so as soon as you press it will go on to the next one um, it's auto rewind as well so when you get to the end of your roll it'll wind itself back um, auto wind and auto rewind <laughs> the great things for speed one of the disadvantages of them is they can be noisy as well because all of a sudden you guarantee you'll be in a situation where you're taking photographs and you don't want people to know maybe maybe you're on the street you don't want to attract attention to yourself maybe you're on the, the, the tube or the subway or something like that you take a picture it'll be the last frame and then all of a sudden it'll be like <laughs> as this thing tries to rewind a, a roll of 36 uh, millimeter film so you know watch out watch out for that one um, as far as focusing range goes as well, the minimum focusing distance of the Mu2 or the size Epic is about 35 centimeters. Anything closer than that, you know, and it won't take the picture. And obviously, it focuses all the way uh, to infinity. Um, the lens, as I said, it starts off at f2.8 at its widest, and it goes down to uh, f11. Um, and the shutter can go from uh, a thousandth of a second so nice and fast all the way out to sort of four seconds which is pretty good but again you don't you never have any individual control over any of those features because um, of the way that uh, it's you know it's a fully automatic camera um, so next up I think um, we'll talk about uh, what sort of film that you might want to use okay so what sort of film might you want to use with your um, uh, Mu2 well as you've probably just seen, I've just loaded up some Kodak um, Color Plus uh, film into my Stylus Epic. Um, a great choice. What you're what you're looking for, um, I think, with something like what, something like the uh, Stylus Epic, is a film that's going to be have a wide latitude, so it's going to be easy to use, easy to expose, um, and is going to give you, you know, not not. I don't like to use the word snapshot photos. But I think one of the great strengths of cameras like the Mu2, Thias Epic, and any sort of smaller compact camera is that you, you use them in a different way. Now, I know we shouldn't do. I know we could say that you know you use your compact in the same way as you use your digital SLR or your film SLR, but no, you don't. The idea with this little baby is that you've got it in your pocket. You may be in a situation where you wouldn't normally have your SLR. Maybe you're down at the beach or you're at a um, fun fair or some sort of ride where you might get, get wet, you know, and you're whipping it out, you know, and you're taking the photos. So I think... Colour photography goes a long way with something like the stylus. You can't really go wrong with putting some colour film in. However, um, this uh, camera works beautifully with things like Ilford XP2400. Now, Ilford XP2400 is an unusual beast in the fact that it's black and white film, so that your photos come out in black and white, but actually can be developed in the same labs or the same shops that you take your colour film to. Um, so, you know, you can take it to uh, your Boots, your Walgreens in America, I think it is, uh, Walmart, um, Asda in the UK. Anywhere that develops colour film will develop Ilford XP2 Super 400 because it's called a C41 film. But, but don't worry about that. It's probably also worth mentioning ISO as well. Again, I would probably stick with a... I wouldn't worry about, you know, putting a 400 or a 200 in. The Mu2, again, it's fully automatic, so the way it works is it detects it detects um, the DX coding on the film. So let me, let me grab this, this film out here, and I can kind of explain what that means. So on all sort of 35mm film, well, new 35mm film, you get this kind of tinfoil barcode on it. You should be able to see there. And there's little contacts inside the Mu2. 
um, that read that so it know what knows what ISO film you've put in so it knows how sensitive that film is to light if you put in film you've rolled yourself or doesn't have DX encoding on it'll just assume that it's ISO 100 um, but then again you know if you're feeling a little bit more adventurous you're into developing your own film maybe you won't want to bother with the XP2400 and you might want to go with something like Ilford FP4125 now this is a very very nice black and white film but this is a traditional black and white film in the fact that um, it, you develop it, generally develop it yourself at home using um, your own chemicals. Obviously, you can send this sort of film out and people develop it as two. I really like FP4 Plus. Um, it's very fine grained. It gives me what I think look like true black and white photos where XP2400 can be a little bit, little bit grainy. By all means, you know, put this in. And in fact, some of my favourite photographs I've taken have been on Ilford FP4125. Uh, but remember, it is slightly slower. So you'd have to be uh, careful in lower light conditions because that flash again will pop on um, but it gives you very nice nice results but you know I keep going back to it and I say you can't really go wrong with some some color film in uh, in the Olympus Mu 2 if it's Kodak Fujifilm whatever you want to do put it in take some photos on a nice sunny day when you're out and having fun with your mates or you know wander around taking photographs and you won't go far wrong at all okay so let's talk about some of the more advanced shooting modes or techniques you might want to use with with the uh, Olympus Mu 2. As I've said before, it's a, it's a fully automatic camera, autofocus, auto exposure. So basically all you do is you get near your subject, you look through, you press the button halfway down that gives you your exposure lock, it gives you your sorry sorry focus lock. You press the button and it takes the photo automatically winds on. But we do have a little bit of control. Um, the first thing we can play around with actually is spot metering. Uh, now to get spot metering what you've got to do, it's a little bit fiddly, but you've got to press and hold the flash button and the time bu timer button at the same time. And then you get this little spot icon, again it's probably difficult to see in the video, but it's on the LCD screen. And what that means is this en en enables you to now do true focus and recomposing with the uh, with the um, with the Mu2. So what that means is normally, if you if you use the focus and recompose technique, so what that means is, uh, generally speaking in photography, you don't want your subject right in the middle. So if you're taking a portrait of somebody, say they're standing in an archway or something like that, you know, you would put them on in, in one of the corners basically of the photo. So it would mean you would kind of point the camera at them, so they're in the middle because that's where the autofocus point is. You'd press the shutter halfway down and then you would adjust your composition like that. So you know the focus is right and then you would take the picture. However, in the normal mode, what will happen is the Mu2 at point of capture will then take the exposure at that point. Um, and the disadvantage with that is that the exposure of your main subject could be wrong. However, if you've turned on spot metering or the spot metering mode, when you press the button, uh, point it at your uh, focus, uh, at so your subject, and press the button, and your your focus lock comes on, that will also keep your exposure as well. So when you recompose to get that subject to one of the powerpoints, or one of the rule of thirds lines, something like that, you're going to get a much much better exposure. Um, we've also got a uh, self timer button on the back, so you could put the camera on a wall or a tripod to so actually get yourself in on a, on the image. Um, a couple of other things you may want to might want to play around with with cameras like the Mu2 is you might want to do a bit of pre-focusing. So let's say, um, what's topical at the moment? Say at the moment we've got the Tour de France. Um, it's just been going through the UK and it'll be going on to France. So imagine you're at a sporting event. We've already kind of explained that the Mu2 has a bit of a lag between you pressing the shutter button and the, the lens moves and takes the photo. So you could miss, you know, a car or a bicycle or a runner going past. So that in that case, you want to use pre-focusing. Pre-focusing is very simple. All it means is that you know where that bicycle is going to come past you on the road. You know? um, and so what you do is you just see, right, well, okay, that bicycle is over there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on that street lamp or on the road surface itself where that cyclist is going to go. And I'm just going to press my finger halfway down on the shutter release. That has again locked the focus. And if we're in stop spot mode, it'll have locked the exposure as well. So when the cyclist comes back, comes past, I'm all ready to go. And I press it. And there'll be <laughs> there'll still be some delay because of the way that the, the camera works, you know, because when I press the button, 
the lens pops out and it takes the photo, but it's going to help you get there. The other thing you want to try, and this goes for all cameras as well, try panning as well. So do your pre-focusing and then pan and follow your moving subject as you're going through like that. Um, and that will help to keep your main subject uh, sharp, but the background will go into blur as well. Another really cool thing you can do with, and this goes for lots of cameras as well, is one of the most creative flash modes, so if we go through the flash modes, is you go to night flash. Now night flash is really cool because what happens with night flash is that the uh, camera attempts to fire the flash to expose a person in the front, in the foreground, and then leaves the shutter open so that the background uh, is well exposed as well. Imagine you're taking... Uh, you're taking a picture against the New York City skyline at night. So you need the flash to light up the person in front who you're taking the picture of, but you want the lights of New York City to show through as well. And so you can use that. But also, imagine if you do this. Imagine if you, you set that mode in. Normally you'd have the camera on a tripod. But imagine you don't, and you sort of aim it. You take the picture, go to take the picture of your person, but as soon as the flash fires... You then move the camera around because that shutter's staying open. And you're going to get all these wild um, lights zooming around, and that can work very, very well indeed. So there we go. There's some of the more uh, funky techniques you could use while you're using for shooting with your Mew 2. I'm sure there's loads of other ways that you could use it, probably better than I've come up with. And if you've got any other ideas, please put them in the comments on uh, rubnonfoto.com or down below in the comments on the YouTube video. Okay, so um, flash modes. For such a little camera with such a little flash, the Olympus Mew 2 or Stylus Epic does have quite a few different types of uh, flash um, at your command. But we really need to understand uh, the limitations of it. So, you know, every time you turn the Mew 2 on, basically what it'll do, it goes into auto flash mode. So, yeah, I know I've said it before, but the thing to remember is as soon as you turn it on, if you're out to the side doing street photography or something, where Having the flash fire you know, would cause you undue wanted attention. Just press the, the uh, flash button and go through to the no flash button, like that. Um, however, you may well be in a party situation or somewhere where automatic flash is just what you want because you want it to expose uh, the photos if there's not enough light. So we need to understand you know, what's the limitations of this type of uh, flash. Well, first thing is that it's very, very close to the camera lens. Any light that's coming out when you take a photo from the flash, it's really following the the the, the, the view of, of the lens, which means that you're going to get quite flat images. Um, they're going to look like snapshots. However, that isn't always a bad thing. In fact, photographers like Terry Richardson, the fashion photographer at the moment, and plenty of others like that look, and it's quite a fashionable look to have as well. More kind of importantly is also the range of the flash. If you're using quite a low sensitive film like an ISO 100, you're probably looking at about 12 feet or 4 meters of range. Or if you've got something like an ISO 400 film uh, in this baby, you're probably looking at about 24 feet of range uh, to do it that way. So make sure your subject's nice and close if you're going to be relying on flash photography. Um, another thing maybe to think about is if you're trying doing flash photography, um, because the the flash is so close to the lens and it's going to be very prone to red eye if people are looking into the, the lens as well, is you know, take advantage of the size of the mirror and the fact that it's very unobtrusive to take candid shots and you know, take pictures when people are looking away, when they're interacting with each other rather than interacting with the camera. So I've can I've mentioned red eye and with any compact camera where the flash is close to the lens or even cameras that any camera with an on-camera flash red eye is its is its enemy and basically red eye is just where the flash comes out it hits the red blood cells on the back of your eyeball and then fires back towards the camera so the center of your eye which should be black is all of a sudden a nasty shade of red and everybody looks a little bit devil-like and the way that cameras like the Mew 2 and other cameras of its era deal with red eye is that they strobe the flash so they make it flash brightly for a few seconds so that the eye of your iris, con iris contracts so the less of a red eye effect. So let's see what see what happens. So let's press the function button and go to red eye reduction and you know you'll be able to see. So you'll probably see this better on the on the close up. So it's in red eye reduction mode now. So if I then take a photo, 
should see the flash kind of strobes and then it takes the main picture. If you've ever been on the receiving end of this type of red eye reduction, it can be a little bit of little bit um, off-putting, to say the least. In fact, sometimes because it's strobing, you kind of go like this, and then you look away anyway. So how effective it is, um, I don't really know. But you know, it's there if you need it. Now the next flash mode is flash off, and then we've got the little zigzag flash sign, and that means forced flash. That means the flash will always fire, no matter how light the situation is. Now this can be really useful because if you're outside and taking say portraits of people, um, having a little bit of fill flash can just add a little bit of brightness to their face. Maybe you've got, you know, it's quite bright sunshine, so maybe you've got shadows under the eyes and things. A little bit of fill flash just pops it up, just pops and just lifts the exposure on that particular person. Because it's only going to affect anybody who's really close to the camera. In other words, the subject you're pointing your camera at. Maybe you're underneath a, a tree or in open shade. Where again the camera is saying, well, there's not really enough flat um, lack of light for flash, but if you put force flash on, it's going to fire that flash anyway. So you can get a little bit artistic. Press the flash button again, and we're into night mode flash. Now this is where you would normally be trying to say take a picture of someone standing in front of a beautiful sunset. If you were to take the picture normally, um, the camera would fire the flash, and the person would look great, but the sunset would be black. Or you turn the flash off. And the sunset look would be great, but the person would be a silhouette. With night flash, what happens is the camera fires the flash to light the subject up, in other words, the person, but then it leads, leaves the shutter open in order to record the background as well. Very, very useful. And you can get, as I said before, you can get artistic with that by, if you handheld, instead of having the camera on a tripod or a wall, take the picture and then waggle the camera around while the shutter stays open. You can get all sorts of funky light trail effects. And the final mode is red eye reduction night mode. So it's going to strobe the flash to reduce the people's iris so you don't get red eye. Then it's going to fire the main flash to light the subject up. Then it can leave the um, shutter open to expose for the background. So pretty amazing. So for such a small camera, we've got plenty of little flash modes. But kind of my advice would be, if you think you're going to be shooting in a low light environment, maybe think about using a high speed film or a higher speed film like an ISO 400, turn the flash off and really rely on that um, f2.8 uh, bright lens to, to uh, and a steady hand <laughs> to see what you can do, to see what you can come up with that way. But if you're in a party environment, you know, let the flash fire. Get those lovely snapshot, uh, snapshot field photographs. And it's amazing, actually, that type of photo, it, when you do take them with a film camera, it, it's amazing how it kind of takes you back to to youth when you were little and you know all photos kind of looked like that but there we go that's the flash on the olympus mu 2 or stylus epic okay so we've covered a lot of ground um, with the uh, olympus mu 2 stylus epic today and we hopefully i whet your appetite for this little camera i've maybe uh, encourage you to the next time you're down in the charity shops or down at the car boot sales or in, or in the thrift stores to hunt out and find this beautiful um, little camera that's got the f2.8 35 millimeter lens could it be the perfect 35 millimeter camera um small camera that is well you know its size alone really does um get it up there i think that it's <laughs> How can I put it? It's almost as good as the Olympus Trip 35. You know, the Olympus Trip 35 is one of my favourite cameras. Um, and I love the Olympus Trip 35. And I, and I think it's great for people who don't shoot that much film because it doesn't need batteries. So that if you've got a roll of film in there and you forget to shoot it for six months, you can still go out and, and use the camera. Sure, it doesn't have autofocus and it doesn't have a flash but there's no batteries. Whereas oh, the Mu2 does have a battery on one, two, three. So I think the Mu2 or Stylus Epic really suits the person who's gonna have a 35 millimeter compact camera in their pocket. They're gonna be using it an awful lot. Um, and then you're gonna take advantage of that battery. You're gonna make sure that you do get 20 rolls out of each battery. Um, and I cannot deny that it is so fantastic to have a fully automatic camera in your pocket as well. So you don't need to worry about focusing. You don't need to worry about exposure. You know that in nine times out of 10, 
in most situations, the Olympus uh, Mew 2 Stylus Epic will get you great looking photos. Remember, it's a 35mm lens, so it's not super wide, but it's not super telephoto. So get close with that particular camera. Um, don't, don't stand back. Get into there. Get into the action and fill the frame. And uh, you can't go wrong, really. I think if you haven't tried one of these little cameras... You've got to give it a go. So there we go. My name's Rob from robnafoto.com. This has been my SEL photography guide to the Olympus Mu2 or Stylus Epic, as it also is also known. Um, remember, you can email me, scalespeed at gmail.com. You can find out loads of information on robnafoto.com or on the YouTube channel. If you like the video, please subscribe and or put some comments uh, down below. It really does help. And uh, most of all, I'd just like to thank you for watching and hopefully I'll see you again soon.